So our first reader is Alec Novella Lee. Yay! Uh, hi. Um, so I, I'm here uh, mostly, apparently, because um, I'm the author of a book titled Astounding. Uh, John W. Campbell, Isaac Asimov, uh, Robert A. Heinlein, L. Ron Hubbard, and uh, The Golden Age of Science Fiction, uh, which you can apparently buy right here, which is amazing because it doesn't come out for another two weeks. Uh, so, so please grab your copies now. I, I'm really excited because I have not even seen the hardcover until five minutes ago. Uh, so this is a big moment for me. So if I get, don't seem distracted, that's why. Um, so as the title might imply, uh, this is a book kind of about how science fiction became what it is today. And uh, it tells that story through the lives of these four you know, very complicated uh, writers. Um, and obviously, you know, there are a lot of stories here I can be telling. Uh, I will say that if you like Scientology, or if you're interested in Scientology, uh, this is the book for you. Um, <laughs> So um, it was a little hard for me to decide what to, uh, to actually talk about tonight. Um, but uh, there's one story that, that seems kind of relevant these days, uh, and it involves um, Isaac Asimov. So, I mean, I, I can't speak for all of you, but um, I can say personally that um, Isaac Asimov was probably the first science fiction writer I ever heard of. Um, you know, he was important to me for a very long time, and uh, you know, not just for his stories, but for who he was. I mean, this guy was the most prolific writer in American history. He wrote 400 books, by, by some counts. Uh, you know, he was a celebrity. You know, I, I think that if you took Asimov's picture and, and showed it to people, you know, even today, you know, 25 years after he died, that he, more people would recognize him than would recognize just about any other living American novelist. You know, he was that famous. And, uh, you know, he obviously meant a lot to, to me as a writer and to a lot of science fiction fans. Um, but, but there is an aspect of his career that uh, I don't think has been really talked about uh, in print. And it's, it's common knowledge, it's part of the oral history of science fiction. Whenever I talk about this at conventions or at meetings like this, I kind of look around and I see people nodding their heads because they, they know about it. Um, so uh, bear with me. Uh, this is the first time I've talked about this in public. Um, and uh, so this is a side of Asimov that not everyone knows uh, existed. Um, so it kind of started uh, during World War II. So uh, Asimov was a young man, he'd just gotten married, and he was working as a chemist at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And in the book I, I say that, you know, there was a side of his personality uh, that was becoming increasingly problematic. Uh, as his domestic life made him uh, more secure around the opposite sex. Uh, he liked to snap bras uh, through women's blouses. And he, uh, once he broke the strap. Uh, it, was, it was a bad habit that he admitted that he never lost. And it was at the Navy Yard that he began to let his fingers grow more freely. So a few years later, I kind of pick up the story after the war, uh, when Asimov uh, is a member of um, a gathering of science fiction writers called the Hydra Club. And this is in New York, and so he gets to kind of um, hang out with people like Theodore Sturgeon, uh, Lester Del Rey, and uh, Judith Merrill, uh, you know, a great writer and editor, um, who Asimov, in his memoirs, describes as, quote, the kind of girl who, when her rear end was patted by a man, patted the rear end of the patter. And this actually is not quite what, what happened. Uh, you know, Merrill's version uh, is that she got tired of Asimov grabbing her butt and in retaliation, she grabbed his crotch. Uh, and he stopped. <laughs> so, so this is what you call a pattern of behavior, all right? And it kind of appears intermittently throughout Asimov's life, um, and it becomes a real issue around 1960, okay? Uh, which is kind of when he becomes famous. He becomes a celebrity, both to science fiction readers and writers, but also in the mainstream. Um, so I say that, uh, you know, at this point in his career, you know, he's recognized on the street, he's become kind of a cultural icon. And, you know, I say here that uh, there is also a less attractive side, attractive side to his fame. Uh, he was still pinching women's bottoms, uh, which prompted one friend's wife to snap, God, Asimov, why do you always do that? It's extremely painful, and besides, don't you realize it's very degrading? But he did nothing to change his behavior. 
Um, what I have here uh, are two letters uh, that Asimov exchanged uh, that actually don't appear in the book in their entirety. Um, but these letters were sent uh, in 1961. And uh, the center of the first letter is a man named Earl Kemp, who was the chairman uh, that year's World Science Fiction Convention. Um, and uh, he wrote to Asimov on December 11th, 1961. And he said, my dear Isaac, the hour is late. I am tired and my usual diplomatic manner is receded somewhere underneath a pile of overdue letters. I will skip all the soft soap and get right down to the point. Remembering your delightful wit and frankly your reputation, someone has facetiously suggested that you deliver a short, humorous pseudo lecture at the Chicago Convention. Specifically, it should be delivered at the masquerade and should be something on the theme of the positive power of posterior pinching. Uh, they want, went on to say that we would naturally furnish some suitable posteriors for demonstration purposes. And when I stopped laughing, I said, by God, I like it. So now I'm ready to ask you, how about it? Yours, Earl. Uh, three days later, uh, Asimov responded on December 14th, 1961. Uh, Dear Earl, the subject, the positive power of posterior pinching is a most attractive one for I think highly of all the ins and outs of the area to say nothing of the ups and downs. I have no doubt I could give a stimulating talk that would stiffen the manly fiber of every one in the audience. However, I am not yet ready to give an unqualified acquiescence. It has occurred to me now and then that there is some age at which I ought to gain a kind of minimal dignity suiting my position in life. Besides, the real reason is that I will have to ask the permission of various people who are or would be concerned in the matter. If they say no, it will be no. Of course, I could be persuaded to do so on very short notice, even after the convention began, if the posteriors in question were of particularly compelling interest. Yours, Isaac Asimov. So as I say in the book, you know, it's, it's all quoting good fun, but it wasn't a joke. All right. Um, so, uh, um, in, in, in Asimov's younger, day, in younger days, Judith Merrill uh, said uh, that Asimov had been known as, quote, the man with a hundred hands. Uh, she continues, when it went occasionally beyond purely social enjoyability, there seemed no way to clue him in. Decades later, uh, Asimov wrote in the parody, The Sensuous Dirty Old Man, quote, the question then is not whether or not a girl should be touched, the question is merely where, when, and how she should be touched. And Harlan Ellison remembered, quote, whenever we walked up uh, the stairs with a young woman, I made sure to walk behind her so that Isaac wouldn't grab her tush. He didn't mean anything by it, times were different, but that was Isaac. Uh, Asimov also had the habit of, quote, hugging all the young ladies at his editor's offices, which prompted Tim Selvis of Doubleday to tell him affectionately, all you want is to kiss the girls and make collect calls. You're welcome to that, Isaac. At another publisher, the woman found excuses to leave the building whenever he was scheduled to visit, while the editor, Seal Goldsmith, said that Asimov chased her around her desk. Uh, Asimov thought that it was generally agreed that he was harmless and that his attentions toward fans were usually welcome. Quote, I kiss each young woman who wants an autograph and have found, to my delight, that they tend to cooperate enthusiastically in that particular activity. And an attendee at a convention in the late 50s recalled with wonder, Asimov, instead of shaking my date's hand, shook her left breast. And when his friend uh, Frederick Pohl uh, questioned his actions, Asimov replied, it's like the old saying, you get slapped a lot, but you get laid a lot too. Uh, at times, he seemed to sense that he had crossed a line, writing to the author, Mildred Klingerman, to apologize for his, quote, unbearable convention manners. But if his treatment of women was often inexcusable, inexcusable, or worse, it did little to diminish the affection in which he was held by other men, or his position as an ambassador for the genre. So that's kind of where the section of this book ends. Um, and this is a book that I wrote, probably, you know, finished the, the uh, the, the first draft uh, almost a year ago. And I think that if I were writing that section now, there were a few things that I um, want to add. 
So there are a few issues here. Um, the first thing is that I've often heard people say that Asimov's behavior was just typical of the era, that it was just the way things were at the time. Um, and I think the answer is pretty clear that this behavior was exceptionally awful, even by the standards of the culture in the 1960s. Uh, if it weren't, then we wouldn't have so many people who felt obliged to comment on it and talk about it. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's you know, you could say very conservatively that, that Asimov broke hundreds of women at conventions over the years. The second uh, thread kind of gets into a, a theme in this book that kind of emerged without my really being aware of it, which is um, a theme of mentorship. So John W. Campbell, who's sort of the central figure in this book, was Campbell's mentor. I mean, he uh, coached Campbell for years. He gave Campbell, or he, he gave Asimov uh, story ideas. He, you know, really helped him out as a writer. You know, for uh, you know the first few years of his career, and, and that was a huge part of Asimov's life. And you see this pattern in Campbell's career over and over again. Later on, Asimov, you know, says he he wants to pay it forward, and he decides to mentor other writers. So these include people like Harlan Ellison, uh, you know, who, who Campbell, you know, uh, kind of saw as, as surrogate sons in a way. And it's true that there are some women uh, on the editorial side that Asimov uh, encouraged and whose careers he helped. People like um, Shonda McCarthy, Sheila Williams, Jennifer Grell. But I think it's safe to say that if you're a young woman in your 20s who wants to be a science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov is the last person you want to talk to. He's the last person you want to approach. It means that the, the, the top writer, the, the most famous writer in your field is essentially off limits because you know he's just going to treat you like a sex idol. Um, and I think this is relevant. I think this is, ties into issues of why you know, there weren't as many women science fiction writers during this period. I think you know, these, these factors matter a lot. Um, and that kind of gets to my third point, which is that you know, Asimov is so famous that uh, he kind of set the tone for the community. I, I think when you're in that position, when you're, when you're the most respected, most beloved writer in science fiction, people look to you for cues about how to behave toward other people. And you know, I think there's no way of really quantifying the effect that his behavior had on the way women were treated in science fiction for decades. Um, and um, you know, it, it, it absolutely affected the way I see Asimov. You know, he was at the top of that pyramid, and I think that the example he set had consequences. And this kind of brings me to my, my last point. Um, so. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about sexual assault, um, you know, the past uh, past few weeks, and one word that comes up a lot is corroboration. Like, how do we know this actually happened? And in Asimov's case, you know, there are dozens of accounts, including his own memoirs, that make it pretty clear that this was how he behaved. Um, but there's also this one picture, and this picture I think uh, is worth sharing. So, as far as I know, this picture has never been published. Um, it doesn't appear in the book for reasons I'll get to in a second. Uh, so this is a picture that uh, was taken in 1967 at um, Nikon 3, the convention that was held that year in New York. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so uh, this, this picture can be found in a collection of uh, photos that UC Riverside has scanned and made available online that were taken by a fan named J.K. Klein, who um, took thousands of pictures of conventions over the years. And, and this one's called The Kiss. The, the, the caption is The Kiss. And this is Asimov doing what he said. He, he is kissing a young fan at a convention. Uh, it's something he did, again, I would say hundreds of times, if not thousands of times. Um, but you know what, what I, what I wanted to do is zoom in here and look at this woman's face. <laughs> All right, she, she's pushing him, him away. All right, it's pretty clear. I mean, I think it's pretty clear what she's thinking. Uh, or, I mean, you know, I, and I don't know who she is, okay? Um, I, I, I couldn't publish it because I didn't know who this woman is, and if anyone has ideas about trying to figure out, uh, you know, her identity, I, I'd love to hear them, but, uh, you know, I, I look at this picture a lot. And, you know, one, one of the hardest things for me to come to terms with while writing this book was, you know, what do I think about Asimov? All right, what do I think about him now? And um, when I look at this picture, you know, what, what I realize is that it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what I think, and it doesn't really matter what even Harlan Ellison thinks. So what did, what did she think? Thank you.